On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. For years, Graham and I have exercised what we think is our democratic right to dick about in polling stations on polling day. However, in the last election but one, we got caught taking photographs of each other, brandishing our ballot papers and wearing silly hats. And we were told in no uncertain terms by the poll supervising people, and I don't know what they're called, they're not returning officers, but whatever they are, that we were not to do it again. And as the, um, whoever they are, poll supervising officers are always the same each time, we decided we couldn't really um, justify risking it all again, so we didn't. But we did bring Hennis with us. Now the thing that I found amusing was that various members of the village community, including the rector, all saw me messing about wearing my rubber chicken hat and came over to talk to us. And I'm sure that the hard work of this democratic young chicken will have the desired effect. But what that desired effect is, apart from making Woolsery a hotbed of discordianism, I don't know. I really like the old credits. <laughs> Regular viewers of this show will, I hope, remember that a few weeks ago we ran a story about an Indian proposed project to introduce African cheetahs into a wildlife park somewhere in the west of the country. Well, as I said then, we think this is a particularly bad idea, and the reason's simple. The African subspecies of the cheetah and the Asian subspecies of the cheetah are very different creatures. And the Asian subspecies of the cheetah does still exist, albeit in fairly small numbers, in a few places in central Iran. However, we showed in our piece on the subject that there is evidence to suggest that these creatures still exist in Turkmenistan, possibly in Afghanistan, and maybe even in Iraq. However, news that came through this morning into my email inbox uh, suggests that these creatures are also still living in Bangladesh. However, uh, the story is not as good as it seems. If you look at the story as a whole, it tells you how cheetahs are existing, they are very rare in Bangladesh, and it outlines a few fairly recent sightings of the creatures. However, as it gives a photograph of what's undoubtedly a leopard, which they caption as a cheetah, and the English in the article is not terribly competent, suggesting that it was actually uh, put together on Google Translate or something like that, then I think that the chances of there actually being cheetahs living wild in Bangladesh are very slim indeed. And then if you go on to the end of the article, and it goes on to list all the places in the Indian subcontinent where cheetahs can still be found, I am pretty sure it's getting one spotted cat, the leopard, mixed up with another spotted cat, the cheetah. But hey-ho, 
It was fun while it lasted. I've been particularly interested in the Asiatic cheetah for about 30 years. It was back in 1990 when, together with my first wife Alison and my old mate V. McQuinnon, I was on tour with Steve Howley and Cockney Rebel, doing all sorts of arcane things, mostly involving selling concert tour programmes and t-shirts and the fan club magazine. But I was on tour in somewhere, we were somewhere in the north of England, and I'm afraid for the life of me I can't remember where. I'm thinking Liverpool, but I can't remember if we went to Liverpool on that tour or not. But we found a second-hand bookshop, and I went in there, and I parted with the princely sum of three quid and bought a copy of a book by a guy called Guggisberg on the cat species of the world. And this book was my constant companion for the rest of the tour. But I have read it and dipped into it and referred to it on and off ever since, because although it is partly out of date now, it does give very tantalising accounts of late occurrences of the Caspian tiger and the Asiatic lion, and of course the Asiatic cheetah. And I have been fascinated by these ever since. So when a story comes through, which on the surface of it does appear to confirm the things that I have daydreamed about for many years, I do take it more seriously than perhaps I should do. But as always with the CFZ, we're not here to bolster up anybody's paradigms, not even my own. And we've taken a good look at this story, and I'm afraid we've found it wanting. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope that regular viewers will remember a few weeks ago we did a little piece about my mate Stephen Friedland from New York. Stephen Friedland, better known to everybody else as a brute force, the man who made the single King of Fa for Apple that was banned because it had the chorus singing about the Fa King and all sorts of other records over the years. Anybody who wrote a song called Tapeworm of Love, I mean, he's got to be a favourite here at CFZ TV. I mean, it couldn't be any other way. Finally, the parcel brute sent me before Christmas arrives, as you know from the recent unboxing video, and we caught up with him to talk about his latest project. So tell me about your... Uh, about your... what's the word? Your campaign about pledging allegiance to the planet. Right. Let us... Uh, let us say... Ask you, where do you live? Hi, Jonathan. Nice to be here again. Where do you live? Me? I live in North Devon, in England. You live in England, naturally. And 99.99% .99 of the people that would answer the same according to their... What is relative to their... Where they live. And yet... If if you do touch Earth, if you put your hands on the Earth and you look at the Earth and you see the Earth, it is part of, part of a planet, part of the actual planet. And people's minds are mostly attuned to the, the nation into which they have been a bit hip, hypnotized since we've been young. We have learned we live in the state, as everybody does, all around the world, everybody, no matter where you live. But I will guarantee you, so if you do pledge allegiance to, like, say, me, the United States of America, which I have no qualms with that at all, I'm not playing real estate. I'm not interested in playing real estate with anybody, with any government. I'm not telling any government you can. Go ahead and tell your people that you live here. 
I'm not interested in denying anyone's nationality, but I am also like that they're Italian American, or if they say they're a, they're Russian American, or person says they are Chinese American. I am Earth American. My my allegiance must be truthfully has to be. There's no doubt about it that my allegiance may also be given. I pledge allegiance to my planet and to the universe. argument. So what I've done is I have examined the ritual of allegiance and there is a ritual of allegiance that human beings into which human beings are inculcated and I have simply morphed simply morphed that allegiance to the earth that ritual and again, I'm not telling anyone in Australia, anyone in England, in Greenland, anywhere, Uganda, Uruguay, that you cannot, because that you may be listening, you people may be listening at the very moment. I am not telling you, you, you should not be happy about your nation, but I am telling you that I this is something you may also want to understand for yourself I'm saying that I pledge allegiance to my planet and to the universe I also pledge allegiance to one spirit indivisible with eternal time that is time timeless timelessness with eternity for all all people. So I, I'm including <laughs> I'm including everybody in my pledge of allegiance to the planet and uh, summed up very nicely in the website Planet Work P-L-A-N-E-T-W-O-R-K Planet Work dot world dot world How can you not love this fucking guy? I was a fan of his many years before Steve Andrews introduced us, and it is a great, great privilege and pleasure to have had him on the show, and I agree with every word he says. We need to transcend our petty beliefs in nationhood and ethnicity and all the other things which tie us down, and we need to pledge allegiance to the planet, and we need to work together to make the planet a healthy and happier place. One of the things that I've always found particularly interesting is island speciation, the way that animals on isolated or even not so isolated islands quite quickly become distinct from their cousins left behind on the mainland or on a neighbourhood island. The obvious uh, example of this is in the Galapagos Islands, the finches and the tortoises, which were the two big things which inspired Charles Darwin to do his research, which ended up with him writing on the origin of species, which is the book which has basically defined modern zoology. And we have a really interesting example of that this week. And I'd like to say a big thank you to my old friend Judith Jafar, who's turned up on this show before now with stories, and once again she has found something which otherwise I really truly don't think I would have found. 
Many years ago, Professor Bernard Hoffmans, the father of cryptozoology, hypothesized that there would be different species of wild cat on various islands in the Mediterranean. And he specifically said Corsica, the island best known on the world stage as being the place from whence Napoleon sallied forth to take over large swathes of Europe. And this week Judith sent me an article including this photograph which proves that Bernard Hoevermans was completely and utterly correct. There is a species of wild cat which appears to be completely distinct living on the island of Corsica. And I don't know about you, I think this is absolutely fantastic news. However, is it just me? Or doesn't he look, doesn't this wild cat, look really quite a lot like Peanut, our own orange cat who has the most magnificent eyebrows of anyone in the animal kingdom? Just saying. There are a few things that I just want to add to that story. First of all, although the news story which Judy sent to me was published this week, it is in part at least based on material that was published two years ago. And I'm afraid it, when it was published two years ago it completely passed me by. However, as all the way through 2018-2019 and the first half of 2020, I was boning up on as much as I could find out about various sorts of cancer and what caused liver failure and kidney failure. I think I can probably be forgiven for having missed it. And another thing is, you probably heard a weird buzzing sound in the last piece of footage. I wonder if you can guess what it is. Have we got a nest of tame hornets in the corner of the room that are feeling particularly angry? No. Nope. We've got something really rather interesting, which is actually basically all down to Louis trying to play a complicated practical joke on me. And we'll be telling you all about it in the next episode. <laughs> If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And as the ghost of Joe Strummer and I are telling you, please remember to ring that notification bell, otherwise you won't be told when we've got another show. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's about it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. This has been a very tiring day, and you'll hear all about it in the next episode, because all sorts of things have happened, which we've filmed, but we're not going to tell you about until then, because I need to do some jiggery pokery. I want to say a big thank you to Charlotte, to Maxine, and to, of course, dear Sarah, who keeps this place remarkably clean and tidy. Despite the fact that me and Graham are permanent residents here. And, of course, I want to thank Carl, Louis and Graham, and Wally the comedy rhinoceros, and the ghost of Joe Strummer and Hennis, for all their hard work and input. And, God willing, unless I get run over by a bus or hit by Graham's proverbial meteorite, I'll be back next Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Same time, same place. So until then, we're seeing you. Mm -hmm.